Good morning, friends. Hey, welcome back. We're back in 1 Peter, and this morning we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 5 together. So I want to read the passage first for us. Glad you're tuning in and able to be a part of these devotions. Uh, this is a great book that we're diving into, and maybe if you're joining for the very first time, that's okay. You can easily catch up. We just started. It's our second installment in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're only going to cover verses 3 through 5 this morning. So I'm going to read that for us, and then we'll kind of jump into the text and unpack that a little bit as we go through. Verse 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, to catch you up and just to recap for us, we've just finished going over Peter's introduction and dealing with really a hotly debated topic among evangelicals, which is that of, of election, uh, predestination, you know, Calvinism as some people want to call that. And again, since I don't have the time to dive fully into that arena, I mean, that could be a whole study topic in itself. Suffice it to say, Peter's writing, it doesn't bother him. He embraces this belief. He understands it. He understands about God's role and man's role in salvation. So we're going to take it as it is, and we're going to move forward in our study together. But what's really neat about this book and about this passage is right off the bat as he's introducing himself and speaking to the people that are dispersed all over this area, Right after he describes these elect exiles in verses 1 and 2, he describes not only who they are, but whose they are. And he has this Trinitarian focus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all intermingled here just in the first couple of verses. Then it appears, I'm not going to say out of nowhere, but it appears that as he is thinking about these things, and as those thoughts are just kind of building up steam in his mind, it's compelling him now in verses 3 through 5, to burst forth in this spontaneous hymn in these verses that we're looking at this morning. So what we're looking at here is another doxology in Scripture where Peter is praising God for the wonder of salvation itself. And what's helpful for us in this passage is how what he says in these verses can also be beneficial to us in helping us to understand how we can better articulate ourselves in our worship, whether that's privately or corporately. So let's look at these verses here and kind of break this down. He starts off by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a significant statement, especially coming from a Jewish fisherman. You know, before Christ, Jews would often refer to God as their Father and their Redeemer, especially when referring to being uh, brought out of the land of Egypt, that he redeemed them out of the land of Egypt. You know, that God, yes, he's their Father, and he has this positional authority. But remember, this is before Christ, before the Messiah came. And so for Peter, as this Jewish man, to literally say, hey, bless God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, means that he is distinctly referring to God in a Christian way. So let's not miss that. That's very significant. And it's showing to us both that Christ is from God and that he's part of who God is, as we said before, that Trinitarian focus, Father, Son, and Spirit. In fact, one commentary states that this phrase here, this little phrase, God the Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that little statement is a compact or a mini confession of who Christ is here in verse 3. And so think of this as, as Peter is bursting forth in this song, as this hymn is unfolding. He's praising God the Father and God the Son as he confesses that Christ is our Lord, meaning that he is our ruler, and he's confessing that he's Jesus, who is the incarnate Son of God, and that he's Christ, meaning that he is the long-awaited Messiah and King. 
And I think it's good for us to pick that apart for a minute because how often do we think that these words are really just semantical? You know, we say Lord, or we say Jesus, or we say Christ, and we, we really just mean the same thing. Peter's not doing that. These aren't filler words at all. He is trying to make very clear points here when he says he is our Lord, our ruler. He is Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. And, and yet that is not enough. He's, he's not just all these things, as if that's not a glorious thing to say, as he's, you know, possibly singing this. You know, saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just good enough to say that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, but that he is our Lord Jesus Christ. We who have been brought near by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit worship Christ as our Lord, Savior, Master, and King. Now notice though what he says next, because in the second part of this verse, he says, according to his great mercy. So so why do we bless God the Father and the Son in this spontaneous hymn of praise? Well, we do it because our salvation transpired according to God's great mercy. Now, full transparency, I used to think that mercy and grace were kind of the same thing. You know, again, it was a semantics kind of thing. There was just two different ways of saying the same thing. And then, I years later, I learned this kind of textbook definition where it's a mercy is not getting what you deserve. Okay, I understand that. But then grace would be getting what you don't deserve. And again, even with those definitions, it kind of feels like two aspects of the same coin. But however, I've also learned that mercy relates to our position in light of God. And as MacArthur explains it, he does it so much better than I do. Uh, let me read what he says. Mercy concerns an individual's miserable condition, whereas grace concerns his guilt, which caused that condition. So what Peter's doing is he's explaining why we can bless the Lord in praise. We can bless the Lord in praise. We can do it because God extended a great mercy toward us. He brought us out of this wretched, miserable, condemned position that we were in to give us eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. And there's no way, there is no way that we can merit this or become worthy of it. It's simply because God's desire and his purpose, he chose to show mercy to us. So, what that means is what we have experienced is because God has chosen to do so. Friends, that should humble us. That should really help us understand that our salvation truly is great. It truly is great. Now, I mean, no wonder Peter is singing God's praises here as he's explaining these things. And these short verses are, you know, just pouring out a song, a hymn, as it were. You know, he's not done yet, though. He also says there later in the verse, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So now we see the result of that great mercy extended toward us. We can bless God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lord Jesus Christ, because according to God's great mercy, this is what happens. This is the result. Now, again, I hope you're seeing uh, the lack of man-centered things that are going on here, the sovereignty of God that is at work in this passage. Peter's not saying, hey, because we chose Christ, or because we decided to turn to Jesus, or because God gave us an invitation and we decided to respond. You know, I could go on and on the, the, the things, the ways that we could rephrase that and try to explain that. No, 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 no. None of that's happening here. What happened is, is Peter makes it clear, because God, who is rich in mercy regarding our position of sin and separation from him, he, not us, caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what that means, friends, is that God made our salvation happen. Peter is emphatic about this. We didn't cause anything, but Christ gave us everything. We became born again to, as he says, a living hope. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's because, I mean, look at the world around us. They put their hope in all kinds of things that, that don't last and, and things that are never going to last. We put our hope in, in money, in time, in relationships, maybe even in the culture, in ourselves. And yet those things have failed us and will always fail us over and over again. Yet, as believers, we have this living hope because Jesus Christ, he didn't just die for our sins. That's not the full end of the gospel story. He rose victoriously from the grave, seated at the right hand of the Father. He continues to make intercession for us. Friends, our hope is alive. Our hope is alive. Our hope is sure. Our hope is never never going to fade and will never fail us. That is what Peter's trying to say. Oh, we bless God the Father, who is the, the, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who because of his great mercy gives us this living hope. It is alive. It is well. It is so different from anything else that we could put our hope in. That's why Peter mentions here in this verse, Christ's resurrection from the dead. That event is an illustration. It's a testimony to the living hope that you and I have been given when we became followers of Christ. You know, if you haven't seen it already, can't you see why Peter is bursting forth in praise here? I mean, this is worth celebrating and singing about. These are thoughts of how glorious God's love is toward us and that Christ compels our joyful worship. What he has done causes us to worship. But let's not forget to look at verse 4 here. He says in verse 4, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So, just when you thought it was about to be too good to be true, just wait, there's more coming because in verse four, not only are we reminded that salvation has nothing to do with us in verse three, but now we see that it's part of God's great mercy on us. Not only is our hope a living hope because of Christ, but now God has given us abundantly more than that. We now have, as followers of Christ, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. Now, Peter is very likely using this language to relate to who he's writing to. I mean, inheritance was not uncommon at all. In fact, it was very common. You know, we read about the passage in Luke with the prodigal son. What was going on there? The son wanted his inheritance, older son and, old, and youngest son. So it's common knowledge. It's very culturally relevant. You don't hear quite as much talked about that today, although I'm sure it goes on, and I'm sure many things are passed down from generation to generation. And so unlike things in the material world, in the temporal world, Peter's trying to drive his point home here. You understand what a inheritance is, okay? So let me help you understand the inheritance that God has given you as a follower of Christ. We, unlike the material world, where all that stuff, the money, the possessions, the, the houses, the whatever it is that we're given that's passed down from one generation to another, those things fade away. The money doesn't last. Other things decay and fall, fall away. Things get broken. Things disappear. Things are taken from us. You know, however it exits out of our lives, it's not forever. It's a temporary thing. Yet the inheritance that Christ has given us, friends, is permanent. It cannot be squandered. It cannot be lost. It will never not be there. And it is under guard in literally the safest place in the entire universe. 
So to say that our inheritance is undefiled means that it cannot rot, it cannot decay. To say that it is unfading is much like how one would describe a flower or plant life as it withers and dies off. Listen, the magnificence, the wonder, the beauty of what Christ has for us will remain just as amazing and wonderful until the day that we receive it in eternity. Again, it's no wonder that Peter is breaking forth in song here. What he's writing is beautiful. It's very clearly worded in who we are and what we have gained as as being loved by God and brought near to him. And he concludes his short hymn in verse 5 when he says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So now as we're reading this conclusion, God's power, this inheritance, it is guaranteed for us as it is guarded in the safest place ever known. Until the day that we receive it, we are to continue to walk by faith, obeying Christ's commandments for our lives. It is awaiting the day where our final salvation will be revealed to us as Christ returns. Now, I'm not talking about some alternative kind of salvation or that we're going to be saved again or something like that. Rather, as you've probably heard mentioned in Bible studies before, there is our immediate salvation from the power of sin over our lives and we are justified by grace through faith. But yet there is coming a day, and oh, how I know many of us long for that day when we will ultimately be saved from the very presence of sin. And we in our glorified bodies beholding our glorious Savior with our own eyes. Peter is talking about that glorious day when we are forever with the Lord in eternity future. So while we have many of the benefits of our salvation in this life, there are even greater things that we will get to experience in the life to come. Friends, maybe these powerful words that Peter writes, maybe as I'm sharing them with you and we're unpacking this text together, maybe it's stirring up within you a reason to worship the Lord right now. If so, do it. Sing a song. Pour out your adoration and exultation to the one that we have been reading about this morning. That's what Peter did. That's what we're reading about this morning. And as those thoughts take root in your mind, as he is penning this greeting to these believers who are scattered all over modern-day Turkey, he then exclaims this sweet doxology of praise. You know, maybe you can use these verses to articulate your own praise to God. And, and however you are able to apply this passage over the course of the next few days, listen, I hope that it will facilitate your worship personally and corporately and, and encourage you in that process. And so as we see Peter's doxology of praise, that it would prompt you in your anthems of praise as well. Delight in who God is. Read this passage again. Meditate on it. Let the truth that Peter is exclaiming take hold of you. And then as your heart and your mind is affected and stirred by that, let the Lord know as you sing your responses to him. Friends, I hope you'll be well over the next few days. And I'll look forward to sharing more with you next time.